Hello everybody, I'm James Bishop, the Executive Director of the Passionate Mind Institute. I want to welcome you to a new series of videos on Bruce Lee, his martial art of Jeet Kune Do, and his cultural impact. Today we're going to address a long-term argument plaguing Jeet Kune Do. Is it the one about Bruce Lee doing away with trapping? No. Jeet Kune Do is composed of 26 styles? Not that one either. Jeet Kune Do gloves are really just Kempo gloves? Uh, no. Ah, my Sifu is better than your Sifu. No, and clearly my Sifu is better than your Sifu. The argument concerns whether Jeet Kune Do constitutes a fixed system of martial arts or is a concept that is open to further development and change based on the continuing experiences of the practitioner. In this video, I will give you my perspective on the argument and I hope illuminate a few important points for consideration. So let's get started. The competing approaches to Jeet Kune Do are most often defined in a binary fashion. The first of these is what's known as original Jeet Kune Do. This approach is focused on strict adherence to the techniques of Jeet Kune Do as developed and advocated by Bruce Lee in his lifetime. Alterations to the techniques and curriculum are not accepted as Jeet Kune Do. The second approach is most commonly known as Jeet Kune Do concepts. Jeet Kune Do Concepts views Jeet Kune Do as more conceptual than defined, a philosophy of martial arts development that does not strictly adhere to the techniques developed by Bruce Lee. This approach advocates the study of other martial arts and the incorporation of aspects of those arts into the Jeet Kune Do curriculum when those techniques demonstrate effectiveness and consistency with the overall Jeet Kune Do concept. Over time, these approaches have devolved into political camps each with strident adherents who hold a negative and largely oppositional view of the followers of the other camp. It is a familiar pattern we often see in politics, the tendency to concentrate into two opposing political parties representing the conservative and liberal viewpoints. In this case, the original Jeet Kune Do group represents the conservative approach advocating for traditionalism. The Jeet Kune Do Concepts group represents the liberal group advocating change in a rejection of traditionalism. I'm going to detour slightly for a moment and speak about the unifying principle at work here. In recent years, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, a psychologist and researcher, performed an exhaustive study on human moral reasoning, which allowed him to draw some conclusions about how groups divide along political lines. He found that one of the most important factors that distinguished conservatives from liberals was the value of sacredness. It factors strongly into the moral reasoning of conservatives, but very little in the moral reasoning of liberals. As Dr. Haidt said, The key to understanding tribal behavior is not money, it's sacredness. The great trick that humans developed at some point in the last few hundred thousand years is the ability to circle around a tree, rock, ancestor, flag, book, or god, and then treat that thing as sacred. People who worship the same idol can trust one another, work as a team, and prevail over less cohesive groups. So, if you want to understand politics, and especially our divisive culture wars, you must follow the sacredness. This sacredness is that unifying principle via which members of the original Jeet Kune Do group cohere. In this case, it is not religion that is sacred, although one could probably make an argument that the cult of Bruce Lee has become a religion, but instead the body of techniques and teachings that derive from Bruce Lee. In the view of those who support the strict adherence to Jeet Kune Do as practiced by Bruce Lee, it is their sacred duty to conserve and perpetuate the authentic practices of Lee. The act of confusing that authenticity by adding or changing the practices of Jeet Kune Do is therefore a form of sacrilege. Central to this argument about what constitutes Jeet Kune Do is a question that, in social sciences, we refer to as systems theory. More specifically, the notion of open or closed systems. Open systems refer to the systems of thought or approaches to an activity that are open to revision and influence from the environment. They are fundamentally changeable and have input and output flows occurring at all times. Closed systems are the opposite. While they still have output flow, they do not allow for input from the environment. Their natures are defined and not open to revision or influence. 
In academic philosophy and social sciences, the systems of thought developed by deceased philosophers are considered closed systems. So the metaphysics of Aristotle, for example, is a closed system. Now that doesn't mean people can't take his ideas and adapt and expand upon them, but at best you can only call these new ideas or changes Aristotelian in nature and not the philosophy of Aristotle. One example of a philosopher who took Aristotle's ideas and adapted them was the 20th century philosopher and author Ayn Rand. Rand cited Aristotle as her chief influence in the formation of her philosophical system, which she called objectivism. Like Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, her philosophical system was embraced by the public and garnered a number of students. When she died, a similar problem to the Jeet Kune Do debate arose among objectivists. There were some objectivists who believed that Rand's philosophy was an open system for which every principle, perspective, and belief was subject to change. Others believed her philosophy became a closed system upon her death, and no one other than Ayn Rand had the right to change it. Ultimately, the closed system perspective was advocated by the successor she named to lead her philosophy after her death, Leonard Peikoff, and the Ayn Rand Institute. Thus, like the students of Ayn Rand's objectivism, the real argument that students of Jeet Kune Do struggle with is whether Jeet Kune Do is an open or closed system. Bruce Lee's thought process was not unlike traditional Eastern philosophy, a mixture of philosophical contradictions. After all, the Tao Te Ching itself begins with the words, the Tao that can be told is not the true Tao, then proceeds to describe it in 5,000 Chinese characters in 81 chapters. In the late 1960s, Jerry Petit, who studied Jeet Kune Do from Bruce Lee and Kenpo Karate from Ed Parker, asked Bruce Lee to give him permission to teach Jeet Kune Do in conjunction with his Kenpo classes. This is the written response Bruce Lee gave his student. X is Jeet Kune Do. Y is the style you will represent. To represent and teach Y, one should drill its members according to the preaching of Y. This is the same with anyone who is qualified and has been approved to represent X. To justify by interfusing X and Y is basically the denying of Y but still calling it Y. The letter is very clear. There are things that are distinctly Jeet Kune Do and things that are distinctly not Jeet Kune Do. That would seem to settle it. And yet, in his classic essay, Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, Bruce Lee implied the opposite when he wrote, I have in no way set Jeet Kune Do within a distinct form governed by laws that distinguish it from this style or that style. On the contrary, I hope to free my comrades from bondage to styles, patterns, and doctrines. So Bruce Lee is clearly contradicting himself here, much like Lao Tzu contradicted himself in the Tao Te Ching. And this is only added to the confusion of students of his martial art because no matter which way your opinion leans, you can quote Bruce Lee to defend it. Now, how do I fall politically on the subject of Jeet Kune Do? Well, I believe that Jeet Kune Do was Bruce Lee's personal expression of the martial arts. I don't believe you can separate Jeet Kune Do from Bruce Lee. It is also true that Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee alone decided in his lifetime what constituted Jeet Kune Do. No one else was allowed to make those decisions and I don't believe they would want other people making those decisions in his absence. The challenge in making those changes to Jeet Kune Do is that any deviation you make may not have been advocated by Bruce Lee. This next part may be difficult to hear, but it is nonetheless true. Although Bruce Lee admonished the martial arts community for crystallization, Bruce Lee's art crystallized when he died because Bruce Lee can no longer make changes or advancements to the art. Just as Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, or Darwin's theories about evolution, or the metaphysics of Aristotle, or in the case of martial arts, Yushiba's martial art of Aikido, their last words were the final words on their systems. As Bruce Lee was fond of pointing out, in life the reed is pliable and flexible, but in death the reed is rigid and inflexible. When he ceased evolving, Ji Kun Do ceased evolving, because only Bruce Lee could determine what was and what was not Jeet Kune Do. So to me, Jeet Kune Do was a closed system that was formerly open. It became closed, unavoidably, upon Bruce Lee's death. 
I also believe that a clear understanding of what constitutes Jeet Kune Do is important for the prospective student. Names are important. They are a form of shorthand that provide an immediate understanding of things. When I say acrobat, you immediately have an accurate image in your mind of what I'm talking about. I don't need to describe it because you already know what an acrobat is and what they do. When I say football, one immediately has in their mind an image of Oh wait, that example probably isn't the best example to give. The point being that names are terms used for identification of a referent by an external observer. When anything can fall under the umbrella of Jeet Kune Do, then the name of Jeet Kune Do has lost its meaning. So for example, this would be Jeet Kune Do, and so would this, and this also. Maybe even this. <laughs> the art of cooking without cooking. See what I did there? This can become a little dishonest. When someone enters a Jeet Kune Do school to become a student, their expectation is that they will be learning techniques developed and advocated by Bruce Lee. After all, that's why they chose a Jeet Kune Do school. When they are taught things under the guise of Jeet Kune Do that Bruce Lee did not teach, they are being misled and the historicity of Jeet Kune Do is being lost. Now that is not to say that they should only be taught Jeet Kune Do, but any additions should not be confused with Jeet Kune Do itself. But that doesn't mean that his students and their students and all that have come after them are prevented from continuing to follow along the path of continuous evolution. They just shouldn't call their departure from Bruce Lee's curriculum Jeet Kune Do. I think the way Bruce Lee handled his own transition from Wing Chun to his own art is a roadmap on how to handle this problem. When Bruce Lee came to America and settled in Seattle, he did not begin teaching his art as Wing Chun. He called it, in this early phase of his development, Jun Fan Gun Fu. The reason he did this is a matter of respect, since he was not authorized by his Sifu, Yip Man, to act as an instructor in Wing Chun. Bruce Lee expected the same respect from his own students. The Seattle group, specifically Jesse Glover, had been on record many times saying that Bruce admonished them not to call what they chose to teach Jun Fan Gun Fu. Here is a list of the major figures from Bruce Lee's Seattle period who went on to become noted teachers of what Bruce Lee taught them. Taki Kimura called his teaching Jun Fan Gung Fu as he was authorized to do so by Bruce Lee. He was the only such person authorized to do so. Jesse Glover called his art non-classical Gung Fu as he was not authorized by Bruce Lee to teach Jun Fan Gung Fu. Joe Kells called his art Wu Wei Gung Fu as he was similarly not authorized to teach Jun Fan Gung Fu. And James DeMille called his teachings Wing Chun Do for the very same reasons. As you can see, the better approach is to avoid the fuss over the name and continue your evolution as martial artists along your individual paths, given what you have learned its own distinct name. It's what Bruce Lee asked of the Seattle bunch that they were free to teach and grow, but not call it Jun Fan Gung Fu. Likewise, it was in keeping with Yip Man's expectations that Bruce not come to the U.S. and call what he was teaching Wing Chun. Evolution is a natural and ongoing process. I have no doubt that had Bruce Lee lived, his art of Jeet Kune Do would have continued to evolve. And certainly, Bruce felt that crystallization was a problem for the martial arts. As he said, I have never discontinued studying and practicing martial arts. While I am tracing the source and history of Chinese martial arts, this doubt always comes up. Now that every branch of Chinese Kung Fu has its own form, its own established style, are these the original intentions of the founder? I do not think so. Formality could be a hindrance to progress. But avoiding crystallization does not mean we get to reinvent Bruce Lee's martial art. It means we should grow beyond it. It means, as Bruce was fond of saying, that we should be prepared to abandon the boat once it has carried us across the river and not to drag it along with us. 
The biggest hang-up for evolving Jeet Kune Do practitioners is their need to cling to the name of Jeet Kune Do. The name itself is the problem. That is what Bruce Lee appeared to be saying when he said he didn't want people fussing over the name. Jeet Kune Do is merely a term, a label to be used as a boat to get one across. Once across, it is to be discarded and not carried on one's back. If one forsakes the name, one is liberated. One is free to investigate what works for themselves and come to their own conclusions. Clinging to the name is attachment. Perhaps the solution is not to remake Jeet Kune Do, but to instead break free from the bondage of Jeet Kune Do itself. Jeet Kune Do may be a closed system, but martial arts as a whole is an open system. I am not interested in the term itself. I am interested in its effect of liberation when Jeet Kune Do is used as a mirror for self-examination. Conceptually, there are underlying principles in a spirit of continuous development and learning that form the philosophical framework of Jeet Kune Do. They are a starting point and not a final destination. It can be argued that those who cling to Jeet Kune Do exclusively, or to any other martial art for that matter, are stagnating and should continue the process of evolution. But in doing so, as it evolves beyond Bruce Lee's curriculum, so should its name. Jeet Kune Do was always Bruce Lee's journey alone. Neither Bruce Lee's instructors nor anyone else had a say in what constituted Jeet Kune Do. Only Bruce decided that. That is because Jeet Kune Do was his personal expression of the martial arts. Did he share it with a select few? Yes, of course he did. Did he allow others to make changes to it in his lifetime? Most certainly not. And that was because the martial art was a canvas upon which he was painting his masterpiece, and it wasn't a group project. Jeet Kune Do is a martial art as designed and practiced by Bruce Lee. It was an unfinished art, but one does not take an unfinished painting of an artistic master, paint the unfinished parts, and suggest that it is the painting that the master intended. That would be dishonest, and in the case of this travesty, both tragic and hilarious. My take is that there is nothing wrong if someone wants to take Jeet Kune Do as a starting point and go off in their own direction, but they shouldn't call that Jeet Kune Do. Continuing your growth as a martial artist, but giving it a unique name are both signs of respect to Bruce Lee. Bruce showed the same respect when he came to America and started teaching his martial art under a different name than Wing Chun. Even his Jeet Kune Do students, like Jesse Glover, James DeMille, and Joseph Cowles, all went off in their own directions and gave what they taught a new name. And if you wish to develop as a martial artist beyond the core curriculum of Jeet Kune Do, so should you.